everybody. <laughs> Hi, happy Father's Day. Always like a Father's Day. I have to say, I've never grown up really celebrating Father's Day. I don't really know why. So I always forget it when it is Father's Day. So I'm not very good at organizing Cora and Leal to remember Father's Day. So sorry, Craig. Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Although I think it was me that wished him this morning, actually. So... Um, yeah, I had a little message from Ronell this morning. I think they're having a great time. I don't know if you've seen, if you've been watching any of the crickets and so on. The weather in the UK is glorious. It's hot and sunny, better than we've got here right now. They've got these beautiful long days, so they're having a great time. Um, as we were saying, they're up in Bristol today um, and ministering to a fairly newly planted church. So that's super duper exciting. Um, Okay, I'm just waiting to see if we're ready over in the corner there. Sorted. All right. Um, so I'm just thinking how I'm going to do this. All right, right, let's. I'll play the video first. I've got a little video clip to get us in the mood this morning. And, uh, <laughs> and then I will talk from the video clip. Thanks. Thanks. We have a shrink ray in a secret lab, and once we take this shrink ray, we will have the capability to pull off the true crime of the century. We are going to steal. Wait, wait! I haven't told you what it is yet. Hey. Dave, listen up, please! Beetle. Next, we are going to steal! Pause for effect. Now, we have. Coffee, we'll watch Despicable Me. Okay, now I've got to say, that's one of my. My favorite cartoon movies is the Despicable Me and the Minions films. I actually have Minions, um, you've got a text message on my phone. So I have a little minion in my phone that tells me when someone's contacting me. But um, the thing I love about Gru is he's got real delusions of grandeur. You know, he's got big plans. He's not just going to like the previous the bit before that was where he's talking about I've stolen the pyramids or someone else had stolen the pyramids and he's wanting to up the ante and say, you know, I'm better than that. I can do something greater than stealing the pyramids. I'm going to steal the moon. And I've got to confess, there's a little bit of Gru in me too. I don't want to steal the moon but I want to do something huge. I really want to make a difference. I really want to be, I really want to be someone who, you know, like someone once said to me when I first started writing, like, why did you start writing? I said, oh, because I want to be famous. And it's like, oh, I'd love to be famous. It'd just be so like, wow, how do you get there? You know, how do you start life as just a normal human being? And then suddenly everybody knows your name and, and everyone knows who you are. And, you know, I'm not into celebrity culture, but I do just quite like the idea of being famous. But, uh, you know, sometimes we can think that those really big ideas and those really grand, grand dreams that we have are maybe not, not so right. And that actually we should still consider ourselves as being... We're just normal human beings and we're just doing our thing and, and God loves us and God will give us people to speak to and, and we'll just go about our business and life will just be kind of normal. But you know what? I, I think God wants us to be people who want to steal the moon. That we, to be people who want great things in the kingdom. And in case you think I'm making it up, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, I think. Have I got it up there? Leo, Leo very kindly decided to help out the media team and his mother by doing the slides for today, which I'm really very, very pleased about. So have you got it on there, Nika? Is that one working? The one in front of me is not working. If you can pop up the slide, then I can read it to people. But in Matthew chapter 5, I think it's verse 27. Is that right? It talks about the kingdom of God. We got my, is it not there? Okay. That's not a problem. Now I've got to find the verse for myself. 
Um, <laughs> so Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 talks about where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a great big net that gets cast into the ocean. And when it gets cast into the ocean, it brings in a huge catch of fish, a huge haul of fish. And those fish are various different types of fish. Oh, there we are. Um, that they're, they're different fish. They're kind of different sizes and they're different shapes. And, uh, but ultimately, they're, they're huge. Now, you've got to know, when, God's, when Jesus is saying this, he's talking about a grand plan. He's talking about something bigger than just me by myself. He's talking about something bigger than just, you know, stealing a pyramid. He's talking about stealing the moon. He's talking about something really big here. And if you see there, he's saying, you know, we, we go down and, and we, throw the, we throw the net into the lake. We throw the net into the sea. It's one net and it's one lake or ocean, but it's a huge catch. And I just love the whole concept of, you know, it's like it's, it's way bigger than just one little person in a fishing rod. You know, it, it's not just standing on the, on the ocean shore or on the uh, edge of a river and kind of chucking in my fishing rod and seeing... If that, you can take it off. Thanks, Nix. Um, and then you, you know, you kind of catch your fish and you reel it in and then you start again and you reel it in. This is a big plan that God has got. It is a plan that he wants to include us in. It's a plan that he wants to give us a part of. And it really excites me because God is the God of big things. God is not just the God of a fishing rod. God is the God of a fishing net. Um, you know, Don has been talking about us being in this Joshua season and we're going to step into new things. And sometimes we can kind of think, oh yeah, that's nice. We're just going to step over a little stream and we're going to step into something that's, you know, quite, quite, quite nice, but I wonder what it will actually look like. You know, Joshua was given the, um, the job, if you like, the responsibility of leading the people into a promised land, a land where milk and honey was going to flow, a land where enemies were going to be defeated, a land where um, ground was going to be claimed, a land where cities were going to be built, a land where, where people were going to be established, where families were going to be established, where tribes were going to be established. This isn't like a little vision that Joshua has been asked to carry. It's a really big thing. I really this morning want us to get this thing that God wants us to shoot for the moon. That God wants us to think about oceans. That God wants us to think about huge catches of fish. He wants us to think about big promised lands. He wants to th us to think about cities, not villages. He wants us to think about wherever our feet will go, wherever we put our feet, that, that's the land that God will give to us. God wants to take off the blinkers where we say, oh, it's just a little thing. It's just a little thing. We're a little church this morning. Wow, we're a really little church this morning. It's the long weekend. So everyone's gone on holiday. So we're not many people here this morning. But you know what? God's presence is here. God's presence is here. And it's that presence which says to us, go and do something huge. Not so that we become famous. I, I joke about wanting to be famous. I, don't I, I do, but I don't. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, but it's, it's like, I'd quite like it, but at the end of the day, I'd far prefer it that God, that God is famous. And I would love it if there's this great big thing that I can do and that loads of people will follow after me, not because they'll say Anna's great, but they'll say, yeah, look what God did. Don't we as a church really want that? For people to be able to say, oh, what's that church down there? You know, it's like that funny one in a, in a, in a business park. It's like, oh, it's a bit strange. You know, it's not in a fancy church building. It's not got kind of all the vestments and the robes and the candles and the la la la. We're just in a normal building, meeting a normal group of people. We're doing our best when it comes around to sound and lights and singing and, and video and online, high online. You know, we, we do our best. We're just normal. But wow, our God's not normal. Wow, our God is the God of the moon. I just love that. That's just... So Jesus goes into uh, the wilderness, and he is in the desert for 40 days, as we know. And he is, first of all, he fasts, so he's really hungry, but he disciplines his body. So that's, uh, that's, you know, the first thing he does. He disciplines his body, disciplines his mind. He chooses to set aside time that he's going to go and be with God, and he's going to go and hear, what has God got to say? What is my Father in heaven? You know, Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. So he's had 30 years of doing fully man-type things. You know, he's learned to read and write. He's learned to 
play with his mates. He's learnt to share with his brothers and sisters. He's learnt how to be kind. He's learnt how to maybe cook with his mom. He's learnt how to make furniture with his dad. He's learnt how to go to the temple. He's done normal stuff. When he's done that normal stuff, he's just been doing normal life. But now he needs to take it another step. Now he needs to do like Joshua does, and he actually needs to move into a different season. And what does he do? He crosses over, and he crosses into a wilderness, and he goes into the wilderness, and he says, Okay, God, I, I know that you're my Father in heaven. I know that we're one. I know we're connected, but yo, I need to know what I'm doing here. I need to know what's the mission and what's the big plan. So he starts having this idea of what's the mission and what's the big plan. And then who comes along? The devil. Remember, we know the devil. And he always says to us, what does God say? Did God say that you should do this? Did God say that you are the son of God? Yeah, I know he did, actually. Did God really say? Yeah, he did, actually. Did God really give you this huge big plan? You know, don't worry. You can have half the, half the world. You can have half of the earth's territory. Because God didn't really say you can have every person on the planet. No, no, he did, actually. He did. I don't need to bow down. Jesus you know, says to the devil, I don't need to bow down to you to get half the kingdom. I've already got the whole kingdom. What are you, stressing? What are you, what are you teasing me with that one for? So he goes in and he has the temptations and he overcomes all of the temptations. Isn't that just great? You know, like he, he wins. And what does he come out with? He comes out with this huge vision and he comes out with a mission and he comes out with a purpose and he comes out with a plan. And so he's in the desert and off he goes and he's like, okay, right, I know what I'm doing. I've got three years. <clears throat> Can't really do this on my own. Need to find some people. Now, I love this, but it goes from like he's in the desert through to he's on the, lake, on the shores of the lake and he's looking at and walking around and he's by the water. I was thinking, oh, isn't that amazing? God takes us from a wilderness place and he takes us from a desert place and he places us beside water. You know, I think the same as with Joshua and, and with the Israelites. They wander through the desert, da, 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 and then where do they come to? They come up against water. God wants to take us from a place where it's dry and where it's hard work and where there's effort and where it's... Um, focused and he wants to take us into a place where there's water and water flows water is alive water does its thing without anyone having to force it the holy spirit is often likened to water the holy spirit does what he does he just moves he just flows we need to be people who can say yeah um i've been in the wilderness and, and I've learned my lessons. I've done what I need to do. But yo, now I want the flow of water. Now I want the delight of being in the river. So Jesus goes and he walks along by the side of, of the lake. And who does he see? And who are the first people he calls? Fishermen. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is given the responsibility and he's given the vision and he's given the plan and the purpose to go and catch many people into this net of the kingdom. And the first people he chooses to help are fishermen. I love that. Um, let's have a look. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1, we see the calling of the first disciples, which is what I'm talking about here. Now, it's really interesting because um, you've actually got three main accounts of this, and they're kind of slightly different, but... I decided to use this one because um, I just like that it's got a little bit more information. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Oh, master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Really? You want me to fish again? But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Jesus comes along 
and he's got a crowd of people because wherever Jesus goes, there's always a crowd of people. And he starts giving, having a talk and then he's like, oh, you know what, people can't really hear me very well because, you know, it's like I'm here and there's like crowds and crowds of people and, you know, Jacob at the back there, he's not actually going to be able to hear what I'm saying. So I tell you what, I know what works quite well. If I go out a little bit so that the people are kind of sort of looking across at me and, of course, sound always travels over water. You know, Jesus is God, so he knows physics. Sound travels really well over water. So let me get into a boat and I'll go, I'll go just, just off the edge there. He must have had quite good balance, Jesus. You know, have you ever tried standing in a boat and it's like talking? Yo, I wouldn't want to do that myself. But, but so he goes off and he gets the boat and he says to Simon, can I borrow your boat? And Simon says, yeah, no, that's fine. I'm busy doing something else, so that's okay. And he goes and he takes the boat and Jesus is talking. I love that we don't hear what the preach is. We don't know what Jesus said here. Absolutely no idea what he spoke. But whatever he spoke, it stirred Simon, who was a fisherman, who knew how to fish, knew what to do, had been fishing all night and not caught a tadpole, had got absolutely nothing. Jesus turns to him and says, okay, right, I've finished my preach now, let's go fishing. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd been out fishing all night, and I've been a fisherman all my life, and that's what I do, and this person who knows, I don't know who he is, got an idea, he's come along, he's borrowed my boat, he's given this talk, so I can't go home because he's got my boat. I'm like, oh, you know, come on. And then he says to me, can we go fishing? Jesus must have said something that made Simon think, okay, it's worth going fishing with this fellow. It's worth going back out again. He must have seen Jesus do something that made him say, okay, I'm going to pick up this, these nets and I'm going to stick them back in the boat and I'm going to row out again and I'm going to throw my nets over the side and I'm going to see what happens. Something about Jesus attracted Simon to do the thing that Jesus asked him to do. The other um, examples there, the other versions of the story or the other bits of the story are Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 22, and Mark chapter 1, verse 16 and 20. I just include those because sometimes um, we, can read, we can read one account and think, oh, it doesn't make any sense. But you know whenever you, um, if you're with a group of people and you say, oh, what actually happened? You know there's an accident in the road and what actually happened? You'll ask four or five people and you get four or five different versions. You probably get six versions of what actually happened. You know, it was a red car. No, it was a blue car. Oh, it was a bucky. No, it was a bus. You know, it's like, you, it'll, it's the same story, but it's told from different accounts. And the fact that the three different accounts are slightly different, but contain the basic essence of the story shows that it's true. Because if it was word for word identical, it would be, it'd be a little bit like, oh, that's a bit contrived. It's not contrived. It's true. It's a true story. Jesus was walking along by the lake and he saw some people who were fishing and he said, okay, I, I would like to get in your boat. I want to do a preach and then we're going to go fishing. And after we've fished, we're going to catch some fish. Then he says to Simon and all of his mates, so now he's got it's Simon there and uh, Simon was like with his dad, but then he's got these two people who are his partners and they're James and John, the sons of Zebedee. You remember the sons of Zebedee? They're really fun people. They're like, yo, we're going, for, we're going to go for God here. So they, together, they're, they're in partnership together. They're not fishing in isolation. They're not doing the thing of having a fishing rod. They're not even got their own, you know, like a kid's fishing net. It's not that kind of a net. It's this huge big thing that they chuck out into the water and then they catch the fish and they actually needed three or four of them. You want to know how many fish that is? These are not like puny little boys. These are, these are big guys who, who fish all the time. They're manual workers. They've got big muscles. You know, they, they can pull in fish nets all day long. That's what they do. But they needed help. And they needed a partner. They needed to do it in team. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? Mm. Yes, you need a net and you need a team. So... At the end of this, they've caught the fish, and they, Jesus says to them, okay, you need to sort the fish between the good and the bad. And, but then they get all of this done, and they get finished, and then Jesus says, okay, now I want you to leave those fishing nets, and I want to leave your, your boats, and I want you to come follow me, because we've got a moon to, 
we've got a moon to catch. We're going to catch way more than just those few fish. We're going to catch people. And we're not going to just catch one or two. We're going to catch netfuls of people. I love that Jesus comes up to me and he comes up to you and he comes up to each one of us and he says, dream big. Stop dreaming about tadpoles. Stop dreaming that you're just going to catch one or two and then take them home. Uh, Arnie's thinking about fishing on Lake Kariba and we got some real little fish when we were on Lake Kariba, but we did get some big ones too. But it's, we, we're fishing with a bigger vision. It's so much more exciting than just standing on the riverbank with a fishing rod. This is a big deal. This is where we need strength. This is where we need to help one another. This is where we're going to dream and we're going to go places and we're going to see stuff and it's just going to be, wow! And it's not going to be because we decided to do it. It's going to be because Jesus thought of it and he thought it would be a great idea to include us. I love it. Absolutely love it. Now, the one thing about Gru, if you've watched Despicable Me, you know that Gru's not really very practical in his dreaming. You know, he's going to steal the moon and he's got his shrink ray, but he's not really thought much beyond having a shrink ray and that there's a moon in the sky and somehow he's going to shrink it and then he's going to hook it and harness it and he's going to catch it and then he's going to say to everybody, look, I'm the one who stole the moon. But he hasn't really sat down and thought it through. And if he did think it through, he would probably be bored out of his brain and just think, oh, I just want to shrink it, and I want to catch it, and I want to steal it. And this is kind of where I'm a little bit like Gru. I have big plans, and I have lots of things I would love to do, and I have loads of ideas all the time. I've always got, like, the next book that I can write, and I can do this, and I can do that. And blah, blah, blah. But you know what? There's all these little steps that I've got to take. And there's all these little things that I have to do, like actually putting words on a page. I, I actually have to sit down and plan something. I actually have to write. I actually have to get onto my computer and post some stuff on social media. I actually, I have to learn how to use a new piece of kit or what, what, what. I love the big dreams. I love the moon. I don't like all the basic little steps that mean I get to the moon. I'm not, I'm not so good at those. But you know what? I was saying to Craig a little while ago, I was just like, oh, I'm so fed up with just doing the same thing. I'm just doing it and doing it on Monday to Friday and I'm, I'm busy and it's like it's important but it's not going anywhere. And it's like, no, but you know what? If your net's not ready, you're not going to catch any fish. And some of what we have to do is just getting our nets ready. And it's not particularly glamorous and it's not particularly exciting and it's quite time consuming and it can be quite boring. But can you imagine if... Um, Jesus now comes up and Simon is like in awe of this person who's borrowed his boat and has given this preach. And then Jesus, this person who's like so amazing that people are following him everywhere and people are excited by what he has to say. This man turns to me, Simon, and he says, Simon, I want to go fishing with you. And Simon says, oh, my net's all broken. We can't go fishing. It's a bit of a disaster. He can't receive the haul of fish. He can't go with Jesus. He can't make friends with this person who's called him by name and said, come with me. I want to go fishing with you. I want to be in your boat with you. I want to do stuff with you. I want to take you to the ends of the earth. I want to show you how to catch the moon. Come on, we're going to go. Oh, but my net's broken. And I think in a season like this, you know, I don't know about you. If you've been in churches for a while, you've heard a hundred thousand times. We're in a new season. Things are about to change. We're in a new season. And it's like, oh, please don't keep saying that because it never happens. It's like we're always just doing the same thing and we're doing the same thing and we're doing the same thing. But every now and then we do the same thing and then there is a season change. Every now and then we do the same thing and we, we do cross over the Jordan into the promised land. You know, it was 40 years of wandering in the desert that the Israelites did. 40 years of getting up in the morning. 40 years of waiting to see, has the cloud lifted, has it not? 40 years of sacrificing. 40 years of burying their dead and having children and burying dead. 40 years of just doing the same thing. 
Come on, today we're going to cross over. Today we're doing this. Today we're doing that. Oh, really? After 40 years, do I really believe that? Joshua did. Caleb did. They got up that morning and they said, yeah, today's the day. I've been doing this every day for 40 years, but today is the day. There's going to be a difference. I'm crossing over that river today and I'm going into the promised land and my feet are going to tread on new ground and I'm going to do something new and I'm going to be involved in the building of cities and I'm going to be involved in the settling of tribes. And for each one of us, I think it's so easy to say, oh, but I've heard it so many hundred million times. Surely today's not the day. And I don't bother attending to my net. I don't bother cleaning it. I don't bother fixing it. I don't bother getting ready. I don't bother mending the holes in my boat. Because I've heard it a hundred times and it never happened a hundred times before. So why is it going to happen on the hundred and one? It'll happen on the hundred and one because Jesus says it will happen. And Jesus says he's got this big plan and this big vision and this great big haul of fish and he wants me to be involved and he doesn't want me to be hanging around on the shore busily trying to fix my net so I can join in. I don't want to be the Israelite who's still packing up my tent and everyone's, ah, you know, and I'm still like, oh man, where do I put this and how do I pack that away? I don't want to be that Israelite. I don't want to be the fisherman who, who is sitting on the, on the side saying, oh, I didn't really think that was going to happen. I, I didn't really organize myself. There is a change of season which will come. There is a big thing which God has got for us. We might feel small, we might feel insignificant, but there is a big thing. So, what does preparing our nets look like? The first thing, if you look here, where it says that what Peter was busy, Simon, Simon Peter, you know Simon is Peter, Simon Peter is busy washing his nets. So he's already been out fishing and he's like caught a whole load of seaweed and some shells and some sand and no fish. But he knows that he's going to have to go fishing again tomorrow. And rather, let me, let me get it washed and clean now, rather than kind of getting up and coming back tomorrow and only then doing that. And then I might miss the tide and I might miss that, that stole of fish which is coming this way. Let me get myself ready. Do you know how hard it is to get ready for the next thing when you've just finished the first? That's a really hard thing to do. It involves a whole lot of discipline. It involves determination. It means that I know that I'm going to be doing the same thing again later because I've chosen to get on with, with getting myself ready for that next thing. You know, when you're tired, he'd have been tired, he'd have been cold, he'd have been out all night. He doesn't just shove it to one side. The temptation for us is when Jesus says, be washed by the word. Spend time in the word, spend time with me, spend time in my presence. It's so tempting to say, oh, I've just been to church. I don't need to do that right now. I've just had a whole Sunday of being with church people. I don't, I don't need to press in and meet up with somebody else again. It's so tempting just to leave it to another day and to say, I'll pick up my Bible tomorrow. But Jesus says, come, be washed by the word right now. Come and get out your Bible when you've got a few spare minutes and allow me to speak and allow me to cleanse you and allow me to get you ready because there is going to be a day when I need you to be ready. I need you to know how I speak. I need you to know what it looks like in my kingdom. There's also a mending. Mending is even worse than washing. Mending is one of those things that it starts out as a small hole and you think, ah, that one will be fine. And then before you know it, the small holes become a big hole and the big holes become a, a giant hole and then you haven't got a net, you've just got a hole. You know, and it's like that, you can't fish with a hole. You need a net. And so often we are happy to leave our holes. We're happy to, you know, sometimes it can be, it can be really small things. It can be, you know, I know I didn't speak so kindly to that person. Um, but, it, you know, it's okay because they understand me. They get me. Maybe on that particular day they didn't get you. And maybe on that particular day, they, they really needed you just to say, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean that. That's mending. 
Mending is looking at my finances and saying, have I tithed or have I forgotten? You know, especially if you've got an income which kind of comes up and goes down and you don't quite know where it, when your money's coming in and, and how much it is each time. You can't just do a direct debit and then forget about it. It's a little bit more deliberate. It's a little bit more, okay, how much, how much did I earn? How much money did I get? Oh, yes, Lord, I'm going to give you the first fruits of, of what I have been given by you. That's mending our nets. It's doing things like, you know, if I know I've got... Um, if I know I've got something coming up, if I know I've got an interview coming up, if I know that I've got a meeting coming up, if I know I'm even meeting with a friend, it's about preparing before I do that. It's about saying, I'm meeting this person for coffee. Let me, just, let me not just rock up there and drink coffee. Let me have spent a little bit of time beforehand and saying, God, what do, you, what do you want me to meet this person for? Why am I spending time with this person on this day at this time? Nothing's by accident in the kingdom of God. No cup of coffee is an accidental cup of coffee. It's an intentional cup of coffee. Why do I need to meet this person? God, what do you want to say to this person? That's mending my net. It's making sure I'm ready. It's making sure I don't have a hole. It's making sure that I've not spent my entire morning rushing around like a mad thing so that by the time I get to see that person, my brain is somewhere else and I'm not even vaguely focused on, on their, where they're at. It's such simple little things... But it means that if we do the simple little things, when the big thing comes, we're so ready. And our net is ready for the catch. So we've got washing, we've got mending, we've got partnering. I love that Simon and, I think I'm one of the other ones, it says who Simon's with, but then you've also got James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they were partners in this fishing business. So even before Jesus said, you're going to go out and catch this big haul of fish, the people were ready to, to bring it in. They were all ready. They were all available. They knew what to do. They were well trained. And I would just say, who, who are we partnering with? You know, like in, my, in the writing thing, because obviously that's what my life is, I, I write, um, so in my writing life, I have partners. I have those who encourage me. I have those who discourage me. No. <laughs> I have those who, who give me feedback and tell me if something's great or if it's not. I have people who are editing for me, who are proofreading for me, who are telling me what I need to fix. They've got their eyes out for me to see what's going on. I've got someone who comes alongside me for doing audiobooks. I've got someone who comes alongside me for doing blog posts, for doing social media stuff. I've got partners. It doesn't mean they do my work for me, unfortunately. I have to do it myself. But I've got people who come alongside me and that I can call when I'm in a jam. Or when I've got that big catch, when I've got the huge haul of fish, I can call and say, please, will you help me? You know what, I've got this opportunity and it's huge, but I can't do it by myself. Could you come and give a talk? Could you add to my blog post? Can you come and do a, do a guest interview with me? Because I need to do this together because this is a way bigger thing than I think it is. You know, Gru has lots and lots of minions and the minions are not necessarily very helpful, but they are pretty cute and they do get the job done, kind of. But even Gru can't do it without the minions. I can't do this great big thing that God has asked me to do unless I've got my minions. <laughs> no, 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 not my minions. Unless I've got my partners. In everything we do, we need partners. In everything we do here at City Life. You know, Dani and Ronell have partners on the apostolic team. They've got partners here within kind of like the leadership of the church. I've got partners. Craig has partners at his work. The kids have partners that they have to do stuff with. We, we mustn't try think that it's the right thing for us to become isolated fishermen. It just isn't going to happen if that's what we do. We're not catching loads of fish and we're not reaching for the moon if we're trying to do it on our own. And then finally, um, I thought this was really cool because we've spoken about this quite a lot this morning actually, is the issue of waiting. So Simon could have kind of let Jesus have his talk and then he kind of thought, yeah, no, that's great, and then gone home. Or what he could have done is he said, okay, now, you know, I'm all inspired to fish again because 
whatever Jesus spoke about made me think that fishing is a really good idea. And, you know, maybe if I can just get him out of my boat and I can get back into my boat and I can take my net and I'm going to go fishing and I'm going to cast my net again and I'm going to bring in a huge load of fish. But Jesus didn't say, let's go fishing. The haul of fish wouldn't have happened. So often, I know what it is that God has spoken to me to do. I absolutely know what he's told me to do. And I think there's other people sitting in the room here who absolutely know beyond a shadow of doubt what it is that God has asked you to do. And I think for some of us, we're like, oh, I just want to get on with it. I just want to go fishing. I just want to do the thing that you've promised me I'm going to do. You've shown me a big thing. You've shown me that, I, that I'm going to do this. And I just want to get on and do it. And Jesus says, just wait. Just wait. Maybe the nets aren't quite clean enough. Maybe they're not quite mended enough. Maybe the right partners aren't yet in place. Maybe it's just not Jesus' time. Maybe everything's ready. But Jesus is just saying, well, I'm not ready yet. We'll do it later. There's no hurry. There's eternity. It doesn't all have to be done in my time. You know, we prayed in the prayer meeting this morning. His ways are not my ways. His timing is not my timing. And I might think that now's a great time to go and do what it is that I think I should be doing. But I don't know the bigger picture. I don't see the whole thing. I don't see everything from the beginning to the end. So I'm going to get it wrong and I'm going to miss out. And who's going to be disappointed? I'm going to be disappointed. And whose faith is going to be affected? My faith is going to be affected. When all Jesus said was just, just wait a little longer. You know, it's, it's a funny thing, this waiting thing and, and, and getting on and oh, just doing the mending of the net. You know, there's one of the things that, that I do um, quite often is I join quite a lot of like book promotion things with other authors. So we kind of connect and we sort of say, okay, my book's on sale and use this link and then you can buy the book. And, and I do these quite often and I tell you what, it doesn't move the needle of my sales. And it's like, oh, I don't really know why I'm bothering. And I was really convicted by God and he just said, you know what, you're mending your nets. You're doing the preparation. Just, just do it again. Do it again. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll do another one. So I do yet another one of these things. A couple of days into the promo, I went and I had a quick look at my like, sales dashboard. And I'd sold two books. I know two's not lots. But two books, when you've not sold any for ages, is a whole lot of books. And I was like, wow. I, I'm doing these things, and I'm just doing them, and I'm doing them, and I'm doing them because I know it's the right thing to do, but I'm not really seeing any change. And then that one little thing of two books. Now I'm joining promos right, left, and center. I'm like, yes, I'm doing this thing because I know this works. And it's like, you know, just do a little bit of fishing with Jesus when he says it's the right time. And you bring in the fish and it's like, yo, next time he asks me to do it, I know. I know it's going to work. And that's how faith works. You know that we just do a little bit and we do a little bit and we do it at the time when Jesus says and we catch stuff and we bring stuff in and we say, yo, I can do this. And God is speaking to me and God is asking me to do things and he is going to do the big thing. So let, let me keep going. Let's test the nets that we're, that we're washing. Let's test the nets that we're mending. Let's go out in the boat and let's say, okay, Jesus, where, sh where shall I fish? Who's the next person for me to speak to? I've spoken to that car God every day for the last month. Is today the day that I pray for him? Is today the day that I invite my friend through to church, even though I've kind of spoken about it a few times? Is today the day I invite her through to a Sunday meeting? Is today the day that I that I'm more generous with my finances, that I give that gift to someone that I've kind of been thinking about, but it's not really felt the right time. And then it becomes this, such an exciting adventure of Jesus climbing in the boat with me and directing me and saying, okay, go fishing over there. Look, there, there's a few other, few other boats over that side. Go over there. Let's cast our nets and let's see what happens. And then I start catching a few, and then I'm like, oh, this is so exciting. Can we go fishing again? And then off you go. It really is a buzz, catching fish, I've got to say. I've done it once in my life in Kariba. And that wasn't with a net. It was with a rod. And it was, I was absolutely hopeless. I couldn't keep the thing on, and ah, like, it was just useless. So I think Craig's brother-in-law had to come and help me with the rod. And I was like, how can it be so complicated? 
You know, it's like a fish and it grabs hold of the hook and you pull it out. No, it wiggles off. And, but you know, when it actually comes out of the water and you've got this fish dangling, it's like, whoa, look at me, I caught a fish. When we do the little thing with God and we see just the little thing, it's like, wow, wow, that's amazing. And then we want to do it again. And God has wired us so that the more times we have success, the more times we want to do things. So let's step out and ask for success. Let's actually start saying, you know what, God, I, I really want to be fishing. I want to be, I want to be like Joshua and go cross over the river. And, and I want to start walking around the walls of Jericho and I'm going to shout really loud. And this time, you know, they, they walked around seven times. Six times they walked around and nothing happened at all. Nothing. It's like, can you imagine going back to your tent with your mate and you're just like, oh, what was that all about? You know, can we just stay here? I've got a bit of manna I need to cook. You know, I've got some quails that I've got to pluck and prepare for dinner. I was like, not by then, because you didn't have quails and manna by the time they were in the promised land. But you know what I mean? You know, you've got, you've got things to do. You really don't need to be walking around this wall. And then Joshua blows the trumpet. He says, okay, everybody, we're going again. And you just think, oh, I'm going again. Why am I walking around that wall again? And you do it for six days and nothing happens. And then on the seventh day, can you imagine walking around and then all of a sudden there's like this little, you know, like maybe the sound of a pebble dropping. And then the pebble drops and it becomes a stone and there's this like rumbling and, a, and there's like a dust kind of cloud building up over there. And I can't quite see what's going on because as my son always tells me, I'm far too short. So I don't really know what's happening. But it's like I can hear the noise. And I can hear this, like, all these people are going like, Yo, have, have you seen? Have you seen what's happening? Do you know what's going on? And you're like, I've got no idea what's going on. No, listen, listen. And then you hear this roar. And you hear the roar of, of rocks and boulders and, and stone and dust. And it's just like, yo, the walls that were standing for the last six days have suddenly fallen down. Oh, my word, it worked. Six days is boring, but oh my goodness, the seventh is the best. Fishing all night and catching nothing is just horrible. But oh my goodness, getting up in the morning and having Jesus say, hey, go fishing, and then we'll have breakfast together. That's the best feeling ever. It is the best feeling ever when I'm ready for Jesus to say go. When I've got all my ducks in a row, when I've got my nets organized, when I've done my... I've done my mending, I've done my washing, I've found my partners, I'm there, we're ready. And I just need Jesus to say go. It is the most exciting thing we will ever do. Way better than Gru trying to steal the moon. Father, I want to thank you that your journey with us, that your life with us is so exciting. It is blow us away huge. It is incredible. It is wide and it is deep and it is far reaching. It is a distant horizon that you want to take us to, Lord God. And Father, so often we want to keep it small and we think it's all about me and my fishing rod and my little fish. And Jesus, you say, no, it is about a kingdom and it is about a big net thrown into a wide open ocean. And it is about a multitude of fish that will be brought in. And Jesus, thank you that I am part of the net, that I am part of the people doing the fishing. Thank you that you don't leave me on the shore and you don't say, just, just wait, we're going to go and do this. Thank you that it's not just the church leaders. Thank you that it's not just the, the noisy and the, and the people who speak easily. Lord, thank you that it's not all just those with money. It's not just those with the, with the good jobs. Jesus, it is me and it is you and it is every single one of us, Lord Jesus, and that we come together and we say, yes, I'm part of this fishing expedition and I'm not just doing it by myself and I'm not just doing it to catch the ones and the twos. Wow, Lord God, we're going to see the walls of Jericho fall and we're going to see the many fish be caught, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that you would show each one of us where we're at and what we're needing to do. Lord, would you show us the pile of nets at our feet? Lord, would you show me, am I supposed to be washing? Have I, have I given up on that? Have I forgotten that it is when I'm in your word that I'm washed by your word? 
Lord, my conscience and my imagination and my spirit get so dulled, become so dirty from the world. Lord, I look at, I look on social media, I look on the TV, I listen to the radio, I read a book. Lord, and everything just takes off the polish. For Jesus, when I run into your word, when I open the pages of the Bible, oh, Lord, you wash me clean. You wash each one of us so that we are whiter than snow, that we are glistening, Lord. Lord, snow, when it falls in the sunshine, is just the most beautiful thing to look at. And Lord, you, your word makes us beautiful. Lord, I pray that there would just be that thing in each one of us, even as we leave here today, that would say, I want to, to be in the, in the Bible. I want to read stuff. I don't want to read about the Bible. I don't want to read about Jesus. I don't want to read about the church. I want to read Jesus. And Lord, I pray that we'd pick up our nets and that you'd show us where the holes are, Lord. Show us where, show us where, we've, um, where we've broken relationship that needs to be stitched back together again, Lord. Show us where I've not done the best with my finances. Just bring, bring to my mind where I said I would do something and I haven't done it. Just remind me of of income I've received that I haven't maybe given you the first fruits of, where I've given, received gifts in different areas and I've not honored you with the first fruits of those gifts, Lord. Father, just remind us of where there's things that maybe at work we need to put in place, where there's things at school that we need to put in place, where there's things in our homes that we need to put in place so that there's not great big gaping holes in our nets, Lord. And Father, as I, attend, as I attend to the washing, as I attend to the mending, Lord, would you give me ears that will hear? Lord, would you give me a heart that is prepared to wait? That waits in readiness, doesn't wait in boredom and, and laziness, Lord. But waits in readiness for you to say, come, we're going fishing. <clears throat> Come, we're going to demolish a wall. Come, we're going into the promised land. Come, we're doing the new thing. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would show us the moon again, Lord. Show us how big the catch of fish is. Show us how, how exciting this journey is with you. Show us those horizons again, Lord God. Lift our head that we would, that we would dream, Lord. Father, even as we sleep, would you give us those dreams again? Lord, as we read your word, as we pray, would you renew those dreams again, Father, the big ones, the ones that we've thought, oh, that's never going to happen. That person or that group of people that's going to receive salvation, that country that I'm going to go to, that nation that I'm going to be used in, those people that I'm going to connect with. Lord, when I've put that to one side and thought that dream is too big, oh, Lord God, would you forgive me for saying that any dream you give me is too big? You are the creator of every star that I see in the sky. You are the one who, who places every grain of sand on the beach around the entire world. And you say that that's how many people will be in your kingdom. Wow, God. How can the dream that I have possibly be so small when you are as big as you are? Lord, I pray for... Every person here this morning, Lord, would you, every person watching online, Lord God, would you crack open those dreams again? Dreams of doing the daring exploits for you, just like the um, David's mighty men went off and they, they got the water and they um, went into enemy territory in order to bring David a drink. Lord, that's a, what a great heroic exploit. Lord, I want to be someone who does heroic exploits, not for a human king, but for you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you would raise us up to be heroes. You would raise us up to be fishermen who catch loads. You would raise us up to be people who march around cities and watch walls crumble. You would raise us up, Lord Jesus, to, 
Lord, to catch the moon. You are so amazing, Lord God, and I'm so sorry that I allow my imagination to be small, that I content myself with small dreams and little visions. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. And Father, for those who have tried to dream before and it just, you know, they've walked around the wall six days. Father, I pray for an encouragement that today is the seventh day. That today is different. That this time of dreaming is going to be different. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for the word. Uh, it was an encouraging word. And uh, just to, rem to know that sometimes when the Lord promises us big things, uh, I'm, I was just thinking as you were sharing about Abraham, about um, what Marcel shared about Gideon, that sometimes when the Lord promises us big things, it's, it's always those moments where he takes us through his ways, like the preparation phase. It's like Gideon is promised victory. The angel comes and says that mighty men of valor and the Lord is like, uh, the, the army that you have is not what I'm going to use to bring this victory. And uh, sometimes we try to look at our circumstances, the things that are surrounding us, but sometimes it is the faith that we have in God, like, Lord, you're going to do it. And uh, <clears throat> I just, want, uh, I just am felt encouraged by that word. Thank you so much. And uh, as we move into uh, the next part of our service, the coffee time, <laughs> uh, I just want to encourage us to just go and uh, have fellowship together as we share on a cup of coffee. Thank you. Okay, and there's some chocolates for the fathers as well.